um, sorry, but we're asking you to stand again for the reading of the gospel. <laughs> this is from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 38 through 48. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist one who is evil. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if anyone would sue you and take your coat, let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to him who begs from you, and do not refuse him who would borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. For he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you salute only your brethren, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Thanks be to God for this word. So I'm afraid that um, really this title should be what we can accomplish if, um, because there is no way that we can do this call from this difficult word today on our own. Um, and so we come to give a faithful look um, at a very, very difficult call um, from Christ as to what it means to be Christian. Um, we are continuing in our scriptures and looking what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. And I want to remind us of the scripture um, from the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount um, two weeks ago that says from Jesus, Don't even begin to think that I have come to do away with the law and the prophets. So if we were overwhelmed by Leviticus reading and the law of the holiness that is required of us, we can't ignore it. I haven't come away to... I haven't come to do away with them, but to fulfill them. I say to you very seriously that as long as heaven and earth exist, neither the smallest letter nor even the smallest stroke of a pen will be erased from the law until everything there becomes a reality. And so today we turn to study what it means from these two scriptures in Leviticus and Matthew um, to follow the commandment to love our neighbor. And Leviticus is one of those um, books of the Bible. Has anyone ever tried to read through the whole Bible and gotten stuck in Leviticus before? I mean, because the legal codes, I mean, it, it, go, it, it goes on and on and on. And um, I'm sorry, father and sister who are lawyer, but it gets really tedious and hard um, to not go cross-eyed. Um, but this um, passage today is taken from the Holiness Code, which is at the very center of this legal book. Um, and, and this passage is at the very center of that code. Um, so basically, we got to pay attention to something that is the center of the Holiness Code, this Holiness Code, the center of the book of Leviticus, the book of Leviticus, the center of the Torah, of the first five books of the Bible. And then add in the words of Jesus from Matthew that not one stroke will be ignored until all is fulfilled. And this passage opens with a call from God, a call from God through Moses to not just the priestly tribe, but to all the congregation of the Israelites. There is no loophole in these scriptures. Not one stroke of the letter can we ignore, and not one person is off the hook. Each and every one of us is called to be holy as God is holy. 
And Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew brings those words again and echoing in the New Testament Gospel passage. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is going to be a hard word today because this is a very, very high and difficult calling. And it is not one that we can do alone. But it is a promise of God with us that we are called to be holy as God is holy. There is one who will work in us, with us, through us, and in spite of us to show us the way. And because this is a calling that I need to hear and am very uncomfortable um, preaching as if I've got this under control, um, believe me, I've been sitting with these scriptures for a week trying to find a way to wiggle out from the immensity of their call, and it's just not going to happen. So brothers and sisters, if you will do this journey with me, here we go. Um, I have been reading um, and have found great help um, from Desmond Tutu and his daughter Fo um, in their book, Made for Goodness. Um, and this book opens um, with Desmond saying this of why he's written it. I speak to audiences across the world, and I often get the same questions. Why are you so joyful? How do you keep your faith in people when you see so much injustice, oppression, and cruelty? What makes you so certain that the world is going to get better? What these questioners really want to know is what do I see that they're missing? How do I see the world and my role in it? How do I see God? What is the faith that drives me? What are the spiritual practices that uphold me? What do I see in the heart of humanity and in the sweep of history that confirms my conviction that goodness will triumph? This book is my answer. Desmond is not alone. There have been many co-laborers um, that have been very firmly convicted um, in the call to goodness and the possibility of holiness. And here's where, once again, I said there was no loophole, right? There's none, because we're United Methodists. And as United Methodists, we follow a founder named John Wesley, um, who had a very significant teaching on the meaning of the Christian faith and its end goal. And that end goal was not simply our salvation, but our perfection of that salvation. And so when Bill and I got ordained, as all pastors do, we were asked Wesley's historic questions. Um, and I'm going to read them because there's a reason that I haven't committed to them to memory, um, because they're intimidating. And please notice the sequence. Have you faith in Christ? I feel like we are here this Sunday morning, right, when there's lots of other things we could be doing. We got this, and we're feeling great about ourselves. Are you going on to perfection? Dang it. Um, having faith is not enough. What are you doing with that faith, and what importance are you giving it? Are you going on to perfection? Okay, well, we're all striving, we're all doing our best, we're working, we're trying. Do you expect to be made perfect in this life? <laughs> That's when, at least, I don't know about you, Bill, but I was swallowing pretty hard um, and answering that question. Do we honestly expect this? And are we earnestly striving after it? Do we honestly expect it enough that we're actually trying to make this perfection happen. Here's what Desmond has to say. Be perfect, therefore, as your Father in heaven is perfect, we read in the text of Matthew's Gospel. Read through the lens of our daily human experience, the command seems like a recipe for stress and anxiety. Amen? Amen. So many of us struggle just to be good enough. The command to be perfect seems to put living into our true godliness outside the realm of possibility. 
What do you hear when I say the word perfect? Do you, like most of us, that would be me, hear something beyond your reach? In the word perfect, you might hear every test you failed. You might hear every target you did not quite hit. You might hear the impossible standard set for you by a parent, a teacher, a partner, or a spouse. Indeed, you might hear the impossible standard you set for yourself. As you read, be perfect, you may find your stomach coiling into an anxious knot as you wonder what it is now to be, what is now to be demanded of you that you cannot achieve. As human beings, we hear in the command to be perfect a demand for flawlessness. But flawlessness is not the goal of God's invitation. God's call to be perfect is not just a command. It is an invitation. It is an invitation to something life-giving, to something joy-creating. God invites us to a godly perfection. Godly perfection is not flawlessness. Godly perfection is wholeness. I want to turn us to a video of one of our sister United Methodist churches, Rising Hope in Alexandria, Virginia, and how they are striving towards perfection and how they are working um, to show and live every day how they love their neighbor. Because it's not about huge grand gestures, right? It's about every time we extend a word or whatever kind of gesture we're extending to a neighbor, that there is a glimpse of the Lord our God. My name is Terry King Cannon. Today, I pastor Rising Hope United Methodist Mission Church. We're a church that reaches out to the least, the lost, the lonely, and the left out of our community. S between 60 and 70% of our congregation has been homeless at some time or another in their lives, and many still are homeless. We were put here to bring the power of Christ and the support of the church to that community. Here at Rising Hope, we reach out to people who are struggling with, with all kinds of addictions, all kinds of issues. Uh, their lives are broken in many, many different ways. What we are about is empowering people to live life to the fullest, to experience the abundant life that Jesus Christ came to bring. As a result, those who we have come to serve in the name of Jesus Christ are finding their healing as they begin to serve others in the name of Jesus Christ. We serve between 11 and 1200 people every week in our food pantry. We have about 60 to 70 volunteers that, that work in distributing the food to the community. Clearly 80 or 90% of the volunteers in our food pantry are the people that need the services of our pantry as well. We have a hot meals ministry where we serve several hundred hot meals to folks that come in off the street every week. We have a clothing distribution and household goods ministry. During the coldest months of the year, we operate a hypothermia shelter. Our job counseling ministry provides people advice on how to present themselves and where to go looking for a job. We do ministries for our children, which include an after school program and summer programs. We are also strong advocates in and outside our community for affordable housing, health care, and a living wage. Uh, when somebody comes to us at Rising Hope, we don't push our faith on them. We don't push our religion on them. We accept anybody of all faiths or no faith. Worship is extremely important to us at Rising Hope. We have two extremely vibrant uh, Sunday morning worship services. Uh, and we have got a praise band that has rocked your soul and rolled your blues away. We here at Rising Hope believe in celebrating Christ and celebrating the life that, that God gave us. One of the ways that we believe God comes to us is through the celebration of the Lord's Supper. So we celebrate communion every single Sunday here. God made us to worship. 
but he didn't make us just to worship on Sunday alone. As we hold a daily prayer and worship service here at Rising Hope, often people will give praise reports of uh, having found uh, uh, housing or give a praise report of, of a week, two week, a month, six months of sobriety. So this is a, a very important element of our life together as a community. Following prayer, they can go downstairs and, and have a meal. And that way we are able to feed both their spirit and their body. I think we can have an honest moment um, as the church that um, this would be inspiring enough for how difficult it is to organize um, such a level of commitment and ministry. Just ask any of our thrifty penniers and the time and effort and hours that they put into that. And then can you imagine putting a daily worship and prayer service um, alongside that um, just as an example? Um, but I specifically shared um, this sto um, story and video today um, because of something else that happened um, at Rising Hope, not this past Wednesday, but the Wednesday before that. Um, at their hypothermia shelter um, at 6.45 um, a.m. when folks were leaving the shelter, um, there were ICE agents across the street um, who arrested them and fingerprinted them um, and let one go um, in finding out that he had a green card, um, but arrested six um, and took them away in the vans, as um, Ramirez um, told a local news um, affiliate. There is typically um, what is called a sensitive location policy um, in these arrests that churches, medical offices, and schools um, are considered sensitive locations. Um, and to be upheld as such, meaning that raids are not to happen um, on those premises. Now, a spokesperson for ICE said that that sensitivity location was upheld um, in this instance because the people were not arrested on church property but waited until they crossed the street. So, yes, that is absolutely the letter of the law. However, um, I oversaw a hypothermia shelter um, in DC at my last appointment, and it was policy built into our contract that everyone had to be out by 7 a.m. So to be in that exact location at that exact time just can't be a coincidence. It is also a moment that thankfully um, we do not live a lifetime of moments um, in the United States but in which we are called to look at what we give priority to as Christians. We are not often met with conflicts of citizenship um, and interests, but in this instance we are, and we are faced with how we will choose to respond faithfully. Will our citizenship in the kingdom of God and our very clear scriptural call to love our neighbor and to care for them and form how we live as American citizens? Or will, will the law and policy of the United States and our citizenship here dictate how we are Christians? This is a question that a sister church, a United Methodist congregation is facing and how to respond. It's a terrifying thing to be up against because it means that the care and ministry that we are sharing is no longer safe and can no longer be trusted as is. It means that the people who come to receive the care from our ministries have to ask themselves if it's worth the risk. So there is fear at best and danger at worst of whether this care and work will again be used as bait or not. I want to follow up um, with a story from Desmond of someone else who faced the question of how to respond when our loyalties are in conflict. By the measures of worldly privilege, prestige, and human success, my friend, the late Byers Nade, had the perfect, in quotes, life. 
Byers was an Afrikaner cleric. He was born into the royalty of Afrikanerdom. His father was a founding member of the secretive and politically powerful Afrikaner Broderbond. The Broderbond was the group that was committed to preserving apartheid to secure the interests of Afrikaners. Byers became the youngest member of the Broderbond at the age of 25. He was the dominee or leader of a prestigious Johannesburg Dutch Reform congregation. He was also the moderator of the Southern Transvaal Synod of the Dutch Reformed Church. But his seemingly perfect life was built on an untenable foundation. The South African DRC had constructed the theological pillars on which apartheid was established. Byers' prayer, study, and reflection had led him to conclude that apartheid was unbiblical and unchristian and that its effects were indefensible. Forced to choose between the multiracial Christian institute that he had created and the Dutch Reformed Church that he had led and loved, Byers chose obedience to conscience. One Sunday in September 1963, he announced his decision to his congregation. We must show greater loyalty to God than to man, he said. He hung his gown on the pulpit and walked out of the church. He resigned his post as moderator of his church district, left his congregation, and as a result, lost his status as a minister in the DRC. His fellow Afrikaners ostracized him and his family. It seemed that his life was in ruins, but Byers had traded in what looked like a flawlessly perfect life for a perfectly whole life, a life that he could fully inhabit. Although his Afrikaner community abandoned him, South Africa's black community embraced him. He joined a black Dutch reformed congregation in Alexander Township. Friends of all races filled his home. Pastors from every denomination sought his counsel. Anti-apartheid activists met with him for mutual support. Over the years, Byers faced government harassment. His Christian institute was outlawed. For seven years, he was placed under a banning order. Banning was a form of punishment that was akin to house arrest. The banning order made it illegal to quote Byers in any publication. Banning also meant that he could not be in a room with more than one other person so that he could not take part in family gatherings or attend a service of worship. His period in the wilderness lasted more than 30 years. Byers' views were vindicated when Nelson Mandela became South Africa's first democratically elected president. And Byers spent the last five years of his life as a worshiper at Osbekop, the Johannesburg congregation that had first heard his declaration of conscience. He had declared to stand as a solitary witness against the injustice perpetrated by his people. He had traded a false perfection for godly wholeness. I warned us that this was a hard word. That being faithful does not mean easiness. That there will be pain and there will be fear and there will be difficulty more than we can imagine or understand. But there is also a promise of wholeness and of joy and of new life. I wish I could stop the sermon here, but I have one more word that I would like to share. Because as hard as it is for me to wrap my mind around what buyers did or this call and prayer and figuring out how we respond with rising hope, what I absolutely cannot even imagine how to do is to preach this sermon at Rising Hope at the hypothermia shelter or any other city that has experienced something similar. Because we can't forget the context in which Jesus ushered these words. Remember the Roman occupation that he was born under. When Jesus called his followers to love and pray for their enemies, he wasn't talking about citizens with the power of a vote who have been franchised. He was talking about those who had no power, who were forced to carry packs for Roman soldiers a mile and called them to carry it for the next mile. The very people representing the occupying force that decided how they lived and whether they lived at times. That was the context. 
that was the level of fear and powerlessness that Jesus spoke these words into. A call for those six men who were arrested to love and to pray for the ICE agents who arrested them. That is the call and the word of the gospel and how Christ asks us to faithfully follow him and to be made holy as God is holy, to be made perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. One final story from Desmond's book. God is consistent. The God who waits for us is the same God who waits for all humanity. As human beings, we are prepared for God to wait for our repentance when we do the wrong and are in need of forgiveness. The story of the prodigal son and his loving father is a source of comfort when we are the ones who have sinned, when we are the ones in the role of the prodigal. We want the freedom to wander and the knowledge that we can return home to God. It is harder to accept God's reverence for human autonomy when we are the victims. It is harder to accept God's respect for human freedom when we must look with the God eye view. When we must stand beside the father of the prodigal, trusting that his son will come to his senses and return home, the parable may not be so comforting. So many of us know the role of the prodigal's parents only too intimately. How many parents have had to wait through years of anguish for a child to kick a drug habit or win the battle with the bottle? How many were able to sit on their hands and watch their child flail like one drowning? How many parents could resist making the futile attempts to rescue their child? Being the parent of the prodigal is so different from being the prodigal child. The example of God's loving patience is no easier to emulate when we are the injured party. The infinitely forgiving God is a balm to us when we have faltered or failed. The same God is a challenge to us when we have suffered mental anguish and physical harm. The God who waits for the human change of heart is cold comfort to victims of human brutality. But God does not have a double standard. That God is consistent as an answer to the eternal questions of God's love and God's presence really does not rest easy with us. I do not have an answer for these hard words today. But I hope that we can, at the very least, not ignore them and wrestle with them and what our faithful response will be in our daily lives, in the neighbors that we come into contact with, in the coworkers that we share offices with, in our own families. And because I do not have the words, but only a call and a willingness to wrestle with, I ask that we end with the words of Pastor Kiri from Rising Hope. Possible. I want to leave you with one final thought. And this is what I tell the congregation at Rising Hope every week. Love unconditionally, because that's how God loves you. And include everyone in that love because the love of Jesus Christ excludes no one. And celebrate life. Would you stand and join in singing our closing hymn, May There Be Peace on Earth? <laughs>